John took the throne on the 23rd of March, 1356, at the age of 33. He immediately set his wife, the very pregnant but capable Marcella del Orto, as head of his intelligence ring, and now feeling his long frustrated ambitions at last satisfied, began to see the bright side of life. However, tragedy struck on the 26th of May when the Emperor's Marcella perished, giving birth to Raymond, heir to the Empire of Francia. Unwilling to rule alone, John proposed marriage to a gifted older courtier, Almodus, reputed to be the finest theological mind in Christendom. Newly married as John struggled with the poison of over a decade of dissatisfaction leaching out of his soul, he found himself looking to examples within his realm, for example the ambition of Ubald, one of his courtiers, and he felt a drive to excellence stirring within his heart where once there was only bitterness. But the heavy burden of rule continued to weigh down upon him, and within a year of ascending to the Purple Throne, he felt forced to make a bloody example of a kinsman, Nicholas de Poitou, who was discovered to be plotting the death of the infant Raymond. John's Chancellor, continuing on the work William had set him on, produced forged claims to the grand city of Napoli soon after, and in due season Francia declared war on Pisa. The army of Francia, being leaderless as a consequence of John's less than perfect administration, was taken over by the ambitious courtier Ubald, allowing his liege to wrest Napoli from the serene doge Isnardo in June 1358. Though ambitious, Ubald had served well and was an honest man, so John granted him the grand city of Napoli in reward for his loyal service. Before the crows had even stripped the bodies of the dead in the late war with Pisa, Rebellion burst forth like vile pus in old Aquitaine as several dukes sent suit to John desiring that he step down in favor of Eleanor de Poitou, his older sister. John took stock of the rebel lords, gauged their power, and liking their suit not, chose to defend his right as Emperor of Francia. All of Francia's loyalists were mustered, from Aquitania and Outremer to the 415 brave men of Malta, and within a few months, Toulouse braced itself for the might of John's host. As autumn turned to winter in 1358, John sent a second host to the western coast of Aquitaine to harry his fractured and disloyal lords as he hammered down castles in Languedoc, earning the respect of the lords of Christendom after the Battle of La Plume in February 1359. The putting down of so many rebels proved to be long work, and winter 1360 finds John's men-at-arms still afield. Can John withstand the strain of rulership in a land of proud and ambitious lords? Or will his son, aggressive but still a boy, be forced to accept burdens beyond his years? Summer 1360 found John still at war against his rebel dukes and his wife Almodis pregnant. Victory soon followed, with Duke Giraud de Milo having had enough bloody constraint, and John finally established his dominance over Aquitaine. Feeling his rule secure, and his wife too pregnant to bear the company of, John set out on a pilgrimage to the tomb of St. James in Santiago at Yuletide 1360. News reached him by rider as he was setting out by ship of the birth of his second son, Martin, and John vowed that he would build a temple for him should he make his pilgrimage safely. John persevered through rain and flood and reached the holy site by mid-February, then made for home, feeling that the journey had been well worth the trouble. As promised, he began work on a temple for Martin, as much to commemorate his pilgrimage as to secure Raimond's inheritance whole. John settled into a happy time, feeling more brave and laying aside old fears, and encouraging his wife Almodis to embrace a more fervent love for Mother Church. John's zeal found its limits, however, when Grand Master Gregor of the Templars requested leave to build a fortress in Tyrus, which request was refused. That refusal notwithstanding, 1363 was a golden time for Francia and Mother Church. The authority of the papacy was unchallenged, and the Pope thought John like a son. Feeling that the continued holding of Chalon by the Holy Roman Empire could be no longer suffered, John went to war with Kaiser Thomas in November 1363, which war was soon concluded positively only a few months later. Trials of war, pilgrimage, and war behind him, John fell ill in May 1364. 
Feeling that perhaps his life was soon to end, he called for a summer fair to be held. During the festivities he found a new outlook, enjoying himself and easing his zealous men, and upon the fair's conclusion shed both illness and the depression and doubt that had plagued him his entire adult life. Having cause to make war against Lotharingia for Vermandois, John roused his sinews for battle in 1365 and took his host to war, beating that county from the hands of Queen Elizabeth and securing it for himself before Yuletide. Relaxed zeal or no, John still felt a fire in his breast for the church and demonstrated that love through chastising those in error, supporting the repair of a monastery in dilapidation, and privately counseling the wayward among his court. Uncharacteristically, John lashed out when hearing of a plot to slay his son Raymond, and he sent assassins to strangle Guy de Poitou, heir to the barony of Beaune. Those failing, only maiming him, he had him instead hauled off to the dungeon, where he would languish for the remainder of his days. In 1368, John's second wife, Almodus de Dax, died bedridden and infirm, and John took a third wife, a gifted diplomat named Martha of Arisbe. Chalon continued to be a bone of contention between Francia and the Holy Roman Empire, and John felt forced to squabble for it again. During this third war in a decade, Martha of Arisbe, her embracing an imperfect religion aside, was a great support, and love bloomed in John's heart for her. Victory soon followed, and Chalon came again to Francia in September 1369. Francia whole, and John sound of mind and body, the decade closes out with thoughts of Raimond and tidings of a holy war against Byzantium waged by the heathen Tengri Mongols. Confident that Francia's erstwhile enemy to the east was occupied with defending itself and finally having no pressing domestic business, John surveyed the circumstances of dynasties in Europe with an eye to forging a marriage to the prophet of his line. Of the alternatives available, John offers betrothal of his son Raymond and the Princess Blanche of England, which offer is accepted by King Wolfier in February 1370. Perhaps in response to this, Raymond pled with John for leave to withdraw from the world and devote himself to Christ as a tonsured monk. A heated argument burst forth between father and son, with the result that Raimond would not enter the monastery, but instead inherit and rule. In the 1370s, John modified the law of succession so that not only the imperial crown, but the crowns of each of Francia's realms, Aquitaine, France, Sicily, and Jerusalem, would be transferred by primogeniture rather than the older Gavokine succession. John continued to press for union of Sicily and Old Aquitaine, seizing the independent county of Siena from Duke Ordulf in 1371. In 1372, Emperor John, having a reputation as mild, was revealed as having ordered the murder of a courtier, Perinudit de Poitou. The fact that this courtier died bloodily soon after began to sow doubt as to his gentle nature. Much gold was required to calm the noble houses of Francia, but the matter soon faded from public view. Meanwhile, Prince Raymond reached manhood, and though still vexed by his father's refusal to allow him a life of serene peace in the monastery, he was revealed to be a capable diplomat, though saddled with pride and greed. In 1373, John's plans were endangered by the pregnancy of Queen Richara of England, and he contemplated murder, but decided rather to wait and see. His fears were well founded, in September, a boy, Prince Matthew, was born, but did not live to see his first birthday. Rumors swirled that John had paid the nobles of England to see to his death, and John did nothing to dissuade that notion. For her part, Queen Richara fell ill, and King Wolfier paced about wondering whether to believe the stories he heard about the death of his son and heir. Meanwhile, John discovered a third plot to kill his son, and when he sent men to apprehend the plotter, she fled to the court of Earl Rhino. After years of concern and keen interest, Raimond, Prince of Francia, and Blanche, Princess of England, were wed on the 17th of February, 1377. His work done, the Emperor John rests in Christ on the 5th of October, 1377, having defeated enemies within his own heart and among his vassals. 
he built a powerful treasury, dispensed thousands of sovereigns to his vassals, and lived as a lord should in pilgrimage, feast, hunt, and tourney. He took a lenient approach to vassal merchant republics, but did not involve himself in wars to serve their interests. He reformed the laws of the empire, and he was much loved by the church for protecting it against heresy. He resisted calls and plots by his dukes to divest himself of his kingly titles, and this has permitted peace in the land. His legacy is, however, sullied by persistent rumors that he resorted to vile murder of an infant to secure a bold dynastic maneuver. The de Poitou Empire of Francia is secure, and the future of Francia brighter, if his son Raymond can protect it and his grandson John can hold it. On the 5th of October, 1377, Emperor Raimond holds a grand court in Messina to see to the business of the realm on the occasion of the death of his father, Emperor John the Gentle. Before speaking to the assembled vassals of Francia there, he contemplates the grand campaign, by which he means the joining of the Kingdom of Sicily and the Kingdom of Aquitaine into a conjoined political unit. In order to achieve this, Raimond must at least obtain the counties of Firenze, Lucha, and Genoa, but preferably not only these three, but also for Calquier, Savoy, Geneve, Neuchâtel, Argau, Bern, Valais, Piemont, Saluzzo, Montferrat, Lombardy, Pavia, Parma, Brescia, Cremona, Trent, Treviso, Verona, Mantua, Modena, Padua, Ravenna, Urbino, and the two counties still held by Pisa to the west of Siena. This is 28 counties in all, a full kingdom of territory. Therefore, Raimond's first order of business is to see whether he can make war on the Lord of Ravenna to obtain it. This not being the case, he dispatches Chancellor Count Gilbert of Amiens to Ravenna to press claims there. His plan is to join Sicily and Aquitaine, and then expand that joining north and south. Next, he takes stock of the mood in Francia, as he finds that general sullenness is the rule among his vassals. He undertakes to dispense large amounts of gold to them. In what amounts to a full day's work, he rewards Francia's vassals for their loyal service to his father, and as a gift and sign of his love and respect for them. In all, nearly 6,000 sovereigns are dispensed, leaving a diminished but still strong coffer. That done, Raimond finds that though there are factions opposed to his rule, the situation is not immediately dire, and prospects are good for maintaining peace in the land. As for the prime movers in the three would-be rebellions in Francia, there is little that Raimond can do. A survey of the laws show that they are reasonable, if a little stringent for a young emperor to easily enforce, Changing them to ameliorate a temporary situation would not be in Raimond's best interests, so he leaves them as they are. As the sun sets, Raimond considers the advice of his spymaster, who speaks to him of various schemes that he might enter into to strip counties from vassals or see to the death of others. Though Duke Philip of Poitou is one of the few unreconciled vassals in Francia and the leader of the faction to lower crown authority in Aquitaine, Raimond sees that he has little support for revoking one of his counties and decides to stay his hand from unprofitable labor. As for the plots of others, Raimond leaves most of them be, though he does ask Carlos de Dax to lay off of his plans to kill Duchess Marguerite of Navarra, and he discovers a long-standing plot against his own life, which he cannot end by merely asking. Seeing an opportunity to ingratiate himself with Duke Henry of Calabria, and present himself as a lenient and merciful lord, Raimond imprisons the lunatic Count Hugh the Holy, intending to release him in due season. Seeing that Grandmaster Landone, wealthy as Croesus and seeking to enlarge his holdings, is conspiring to establish a claim on the county of Safed, Raimond begs him to desist. Count Roger of Apulia's designs on the Republic of Apulia are similarly stayed for the mere asking. Seeking to ingratiate himself with Mother Church and her vassals within Francia's borders, Raimond considers a donation to one or another of the holy orders his father vassalized. 
Seeing that the Hospitallers are well supplied with gold and the Templars poor, he donates 300 sovereigns to Grandmaster Gilbert. The day's work almost done, Raimond tells his vassals to prepare for a grand hunt to be held on the royal domain lands in Messina starting the next day. The moon now grows high in the sky, and Raimond is told that his aggressive first day as Emperor of Francia has yielded positive results, and the land has reached the apex of noble customs and respect for the imperial office. A discussion with his court chaplain tells him that the Holy See's authority is unimpeachable, and that Sylvester, though as yet undecided about Raimond, is at least not hostile. Feeling that he has not learned enough in the ways of war to rule, Raimond sets his mind to study and practice. In a late night session with his advisors, Raimond chooses to divest himself of three holdings that he cannot efficiently administrate. Finding that Duke Leon of Burgundy greatly desires Chalon, Macon, and Charlie, Raimond decides to enlarge him and secure the loyalty of this Duke of the Scarpernois dynasty. Unable to do anything further to reconcile Duke Philip of Poitou, who is racked with ambition, desire for the kingship of Aquitaine, and a dislike of Raimond's greed, the Emperor Raimond decides to leave it in the hands of God and retires at last for the day. Let's take it easy and slow. Thank the Blessed Virgin for Baron Bartomeu. I will admit failure here. Baron Bartomeu. Oh, very good. So, Baron Bartomeu. You shall have the county of Burgogne. Yes, you are forgiven. You are also forgiven. Very good. We're going on another grand hunt. Let's release him from prison. And let's thank the Blessed Virgin for Count Bartomeu. Very good. Now, let's hold a feast. What makes him unhappy? Can I send him a gift? Yes. What of the Duke of Brittany? Will another gift be good? No. Alright, everyone should attend this feast. Spend lavishly on food. I could declare war on.
Hmm. Huh. Duke Ferrand. Oh, very nice. That's disgusting. Very good. Very good. Outstanding. Very good. What does he want? Oh, yes. Yes. Well, having a female heir is a bit of a problem, yes. Understood. Pope feels pretty good. Factions well under control here. And it's time to go on a pilgrimage. Hmm, let us visit the Holy Land. The journey begins. Let's have these men go here and... Let's put somebody in charge of this rabble. Landon. Last few days of my journey on water. This is fascinating. Praised be Jesus, a most welcome escort. Tempered, greedy, gregarious, proud, on pilgrimage. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Yeah, being gregarious. Let's meet new people. Very good. Oh, we feel that Duke Raymond Berengui of Provence feels that. So, Duke Louis the Third of Orleans. Who is this man? Oh, he has this, he has this duchy here, and this duchy here, and two counties. Oh, let's, let's join that. So Duchess Constancia has usurped the, the title Duchy of Champagne. So now she has this duchy. Very good. Very good. So, now he has this. <laughs> Very good. Well, be that as it may. Let's hold this grand tournament. Can I go to war with Pisa for anything? I can claim Butera. <sighs> All right. Oh, Poisson, most unfortunate.
Let's talk to Count Baudouin some more. Oh, most unfortunate. Yes, let us assemble the mob. Serene Doge Stentore, eh? He wants control of the grand city of Napoli. Well, everything is proceeding as I have foreseen. Very good. Excellent. Most unfortunate. Good job, Matthias. What plots are available to me? Very good. Oh, I'll leave all that alone. Order needs more castles, eh? Hmm. Very well. Duke Eben. Hmm. Will not take any more gold? Keep him happy. Good press de jour ducal claims. Now, who's this? Kaiser and Oda of the Holy Roman Empire? Hmm. No, we'll leave it alone for now. I wish to do it in a way where I can press all my claims at once. I think matters are suitably under control and I can go a bit faster. My friend, tell me more about these scholars. Hurry up, I'm going on a... I'm going on a hunt. Thank the Lord for Count Bartholomew. Chase down that stag. Very good. It is time for a feast. Just repair it.
Duchess Margarita of Navarra seeks to fabricate a claim on the Kingdom of Aquitaine. Will you end your plot? Let us release her. The imprisonment and the releasing of nobles is a very, very fine sport. January 1380 finds Emperor Raimond ruling over a well-pacified Francia. Well begun is half done, and his foresight and aggressive administration has allowed his reign to proceed peacefully, with his chancellor working in Ravenna while he sports and feasts. Raimond has been fortunate, and has used ploys of imprisoning guilty nobles and then releasing them to win over the love of Francia's vassals. The 18-year-old Empress Blanche waits for the crown of England, and while no child has come to the imperial couple, prospects are good for the future union of these two powerful realms.